the brain is is so it's so mysterious. I mean, it's three and a half pounds of the the most enigmatic tissue in the known universe. It contains all of our dreams and our thoughts and our joys and our loves and everything. And that's what really got me interested in it. Now, I will say that for much of my career as a neurosurgeon, we're talking about the medicalization of the brain. Um, that's what I learned. Um, how to to address problems such as tumors and blood collections on top of the brain, things like that. I think it was really over the last 20 years now, especially as a journalist, where I started to do these deeper investigations and to, to sort of look at the brain in, in a different way, uh, not just treatment of disease, but optimization of brain. And I sort of got to the point now where I think we are thinking of the brain the same way we thought about the heart a quarter century ago. We thought it was just, you got what you got, that was it, nothing to be done. That's how we thought about the heart. Um, that is how we thought about the brain. And neither one of those things are true. And I think that's really inspiring that we can actually improve our brain function throughout our lives. We've, we've come so far. The center is 25 years old. But it wasn't too long ago when most people in the scientific profession, including the ones who are supposed to know, <laughs> really we're, we're thinking that the brain was not changeable. Can right. you, you talk a little bit about the evolution of, of that change in medicine? I think the idea of, of treatment of a brain problem, diagnosing the problem and then treatment of the problem, that was where and, and really, frankly, is still where most of the attention is, is placed. Uh, understandably, people come in with a particular problem, and you diagnose that problem, and then it's treated. Um, we have, over the last you know, 10, 15, 20 years, we have evolved to start thinking about prevention more, even when it comes to brain disease. We've thought about prevention with lots of other diseases for longer. But again, I think the brain has always been a bit mystical for people, perhaps because it's encased in skull and, you know, we, we think it's um, a black box. A black box is something that can be measured by its inputs and its outputs, but you can't really see the machinations of how it works. But as we've started to be able to, to see the brain, not only in a pathological state, a disease state or an injured state, but in a healthy state as well, I think we've started to understand the brain more in terms of what could prevent certain problems, but also the idea of optimization, which I think is the further evolution of that. It's not just that I want to prevent disease. I want to make sure my, in this case, brain is functioning as well as it possibly can. How do I optimize that sort of function? So I think that that is that has sort of been um, the, the standard evolution. That, that's been the evolution, I think, in medicine all along. But the brain is sort of the 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 last one to the table, I think in part because it's been treated with reverence, but also with this mysticism. We only got to look at the brain when there was a problem. But the question was, what is happening when there's not a problem? Um, is it actually continuing to grow, continuing to spawn new cells? Um, and the answer is yes. We do continue to grow new brain cells at any age. Um, and I think that was a pretty revelatory thing. I remember when neuroscientists first started talking about it at these meetings I would attend a decade ago, there was sort of the fringe meeting you know, at the end of the session. Uh, and now it's, it's sort of front and center, I think, the idea that we can grow new brain cells at any age. And by the way, here's how you can continue to do that. And I, I want to talk to you about moving the public at large along this continuum of understanding of the brain health. We, we're all humans. Why are there some places where this just does not occur as much as it does here? And are there lessons that we can learn from those places and then apply them here? My parents are both automotive engineers. So every time I would come home from medical school or whatever and talk about what I'd learned, They'd say, oh, well, that's just like the car. You know, you got to add more oil over here. You got to make sure the brakes are running well. You know, you got to make sure you can accelerate and decelerate quickly that you're not overheating the car. And what is happening during sleep to your brain? What is happening during stress to your brain? When you start to understand those things, I think it fundamentally changes how you, you react, um, how you take care of your brain. I meditate every day now. What I've realized, um, Sarah, is that people say, I want to live a life without stress. That's not a good idea. 
you need stress. It gets you out of bed in the morning. It helps you overcome jet lag, study for an exam, whatever it may be. It's not the stress. It's the relentless nature of the stress that is the problem. We need to cool the car, just like my dad said. We can run it hot, but it's got to be cooled down afterward. And so for me, the meditation walks in nature, things that I previously saw as a luxury. Now when I'm doing it, breathing in all those phytoncides, these stress-busting chemicals in nature, that aroma of the forest, that is something that's actually good for my brain. And it helps bust or at least relieve that stress for periods of time so that I can run the car hot again if I need to. And so I saw those things as a luxury before. Now I see them as a necessity. And I imagine when I'm doing them, how good it is for my brain. There are trees surrounding the space. And immediately the temperature goes down. The calmness goes up a little bit. And so we've been talking a little bit about design, deliberate design so that we can foster better brain health. What is interesting uh, is, is this idea that sometimes we tend to think of things as, as binary, like we need to create a, an entire environment that fosters a particular thing, um, in this case, brain health. It, it, it's the breaks. It, it's finding places that you can actually go and get a break from the stress or the break from the incessant nature of the stress, at least. So um, everyone's heard the term blue zones. But the idea that you're talking about these trees as you come into a space to have these green zones, we find that even looking at nature can be helpful. You're not necessarily going to get the phytoncides, but you're getting a lot of the benefits of, of being out in nature just by looking at nature. Being within a certain distance from nature can be really helpful. But finding places within a, an environment where you can get a break from the stress, I think becomes really important. It's not to say that in your office space or other spaces that you want to be, you know, working hard and really being able to get your, your, your work done. Um, but are there places where you can go to sort of decompress for a while to let the engine cool? What distance from green spaces, green zones end up making a difference? And I think they found that within a few hundred meters, if there was trees and, and areas that you could go or at least see, that ended up making a difference in terms of uh, overall design for, for relieving stress. Not, not completely removing it, but at least relieving it for periods of time. Mm -hmm. What is brain health? What is good brain health? Um, how do you measure that? And, and then how do you collect that data and show that certain things that you do for your brain actually improve your brain health. So we're not sort of guessing or, or sharing just anecdotal stories. Uh, again, it's the same sort of thinking that I think was going on with heart health, you know, several decades ago. Now it's sort of accepted that you should lower your blood pressure, that too high cholesterol is not a good thing, that here's a, a better diet for that and, and, and all sorts of things. Um, uh, how, how do we get to that level of brain health, uh, measurements of brain health with the brain, which is understandably and arguably much harder to measure? What is the role of resilience when it comes to brain health? Is that a, is that a marker of good brain health? Clarity. These are things from the Center for, for Brain Health's website. Connectedness. Um, what does that mean to have actual connections? Is that measurable? Um I, I find that fascinating. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just expound on that for a second. When I was writing about the idea of isolation and loneliness being bad for the brain, again, that's, that shouldn't surprise anybody. We need to be having connections with people. And even when I wrote that it's not the quantity of these connections, but the quality, also not surprising. But what does that mean to have a high quality connection? How do you measure that? Is it someone, you know, someone you can call if you have a problem? Okay, yeah, but that's sort of medicalizing it again. Not necessarily exactly what we're sort of trying to get at here. Uh, when I interviewed a lot of loneliness researchers about the specific idea of the connection between isolation and loneliness and brain health, um, I think what I heard was a, a, a very interesting uh, supposition, which was that... Um, I, I was talking about my own parents, for example, and you know I'm very close to my parents. They're older. They live in a different state. Uh, I would call them and say, how you doing? I'm doing fine. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Um, and it was, we talk a lot, but the conversations 
were were sort of superficial. Mm -hmm. And this loneliness researcher said to me, the next time you talk to them, ask for help in some small way. Just ask for help. Um, and as I mentioned, my parents are both automotive engineers and my wife had come home and her car had some smoke coming out from underneath the hood. So I said, oh, mom and dad, while well, I got you, um, you know, the cars had some smoke and this, that, and the other thing. Right away, they put on the reading glasses, turn on your FaceTime, open the hood. And, you know, I'm, I'm showing them this and, and all that. The point wasn't that the car had smoke coming from the hood. It was all of a sudden this different interaction that we were having. And more importantly, it did two things. It allowed me to be vulnerable around my parents and allowed me to give purpose to my parents. My parents had this now purpose that was driving it. And it led to all these other conversations that were had nothing to do with the car. Mm -hmm. But that was for her, this loneliness researcher, an example of how you hack your way, for example, to a to a a, a more profound relationship, a more quality relationship. So uh, it's a long answer to your question, but I think, you know, understanding what the factors are for the optimization of brain health, being able to me to really define those, being able to measure those for people, uh, such as I think the Center for Brain Health does, and, and other people talk about this a lot, but the idea of what is the value of clarity? What is the value of connectedness? What is the value of emotional balance slash resilience? Um, and then following those things over time with interventions. Hey, when you sleep, you know, you're consolidating long memories, you're, you're clearing away waste, and look what that's done for the clarity of your thinking. Um, I, I, I find all of that really, really fascinating, and I do believe that as with Framingham for heart disease, as with the Happiness Project at Harvard, um, I think that we could be in that same position within the next several years when it comes to brain health, that it's not just going to feel like anecdotal, like, yeah, I know I should do good things for my brain but actually really, really um, prescriptive in a way that is accessible for people, that this is what I do for good brain health, and it becomes a way of, of life for people. That's a dream, but it's a really, really good dream. And attainable, I would say, attainable. and we're just yeah. the group to do it. No, you see, that's the whole point is that you can you can continue to improve your, your brain at any age. So, you know, <laughs> if you keep that car running and, you know, you, you take good care of it, could actually last a long time. 90% of the attention has been focused on probably 10% of the problem when it comes to brain issues. And, and, you know, again, some of that is understandable. Someone comes in with a brain injury, you need to take care of that brain injury. If they have a blood collection on top of the brain, an epidural hematoma or a subdural, that needs to be relieved so that you can take pressure off the brain or, or whatever the problem may be. But I think the, the, the path leading up to that and the path after that is, is where we have focused not enough attention. So, and that's 90% of the, of the issues. So I do think, you know, the idea that, that there is something that can be done to, to protect and optimize the brain throughout our lives, regardless of TBI, but also that if someone has a traumatic brain injury, that, okay, you've saved their life. That's great and very, very important. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's part of what attracted me to neurosurgery. But the aftermath of that, like all the various things that can be done to now improve and even optimize their brain function after something like that is where more attention needs to be focused. And even when it comes to Alzheimer's dementia or dementias in general, we spend a fraction of the money that we spend on other diseases. I, I think in some ways it almost feels like um, there's been a throwing in of the towel sometimes when it comes to to the optimization of, of brain health. Um, I think it's starting to change. Here, here's something I would suggest you do every day for your brain. Um, go for a brisk walk with a close friend and talk about your problems. It incorporated for me many things. Brisk walking for all the reasons we talked about earlier, the connectedness of actually calling up a friend and doing that, that quality connection. But then the hack of creating the profundity of the relationship by talking about your problems, by allowing yourself to be vulnerable.